So, and I've seen that in former Yugoslavia. Suddenly, this becomes a whole power that comes at you from the outside. You participate in it, and, and there's a, di a dialogue, uh, almost like a dance between the individual evil in the heart and evil outside. Today on Reset, we go back to the beginning with Miroslav Volf. He is the professor of systematic theology at Yale University, and he is the author of many books, including the Christian classic on conflict, entitled Exclusion and Embrace. And he joins me now on the line from New Haven, Connecticut. Miroslav Volf, thank you so much for joining us. It's absolutely splendid to be with you. Great. Thank you so much for, for giving some time. Um, your book, Exclusion and Embrace, it was uh, first uh, released in 1996, uh, and yet it has proved such a classic, and uh, it has a, an ability to explain and speak into our time, such that uh, it's now been uh, re-released with new material in 2020. Uh, can you tell us where the book came from? Because your own story is kind of woven into it. Isn't that right? Yeah, in a sense, um, uh, you, you know, people write books for different uh, purposes, uh, but um, th this book had uh, originally uh, intended audience of one, <laughs> and it was me. Uh, I was hmm. trying to figure out um, how to deal with um, conflict that was raging in former Yugoslavia, in which third of uh, what was my country, Croatia, was occupied, where... Um, villages have been emptied of their population and uh, uh, cultural monuments and churches um, often destroyed. And so my question then was for myself, how do I, and how do I specifically, not simply qua human being, but how do I as a Christian respond to um, that massive of violation? And that led me then in the trail of uh, research, uh, what kind of categories do I apply? What do I do uh, with this? What does it demand of me as, the, as a Christian? And that's how the metaphor of embrace emerged uh, for, for me. And it owes its existence to the most famous of the embraces, uh, one of the most famous of the embraces in the Bible, which is the story of the prodigal son where the father embraces the returning uh, prodigal and reestablishes uh, father's home as that son's home once again. So story of conflict and reconciliation. Right. And so the, the embrace is the resolution, the, the embrace is the reconciliation. Um, but that first word, um, uh, exclusion, and embrace. Um, what is it that comes naturally to the, the human heart such that we want to exclude others? Well, I mean, uh, we are material beings. We are fragile uh, beings. Uh, we need our space and we need our dignity. And Sometimes our dignity and somebody else's dignity, our space and somebody else's space uh, are in conflict. And often uh, that's where the struggle uh, arises. Uh, we want what the other person uh, has. We are insecure in our own uh, position. And that drives us then to, uh, to exclude, to assert ourselves over against uh, another person. And um, often that gets magnified when it's not just a question of individual people um, dealing with one another, but the whole entities, uh, uh, people groups, uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, or uh, national nations, whole nations. Once you see yourself as belonging to a nation, the nation suddenly starts to resonate in your heart and you become a nation, and then conflicts uh, emerge between, between groups and are magnified and are more, it's more difficult to resolve them. So it's very much an identity question then, you know, who, who am I by myself? What, what clan do I belong to? What tribe? What nation? What, what are some of the things that feed into our sense of identity in that sense? 
Well, it's a, it is a question of identity, but it is a question also of, um, of power. It's a question of uh, economic resources. So uh, I, I do treat this question and think of it uh, in terms of identity. And I think identity is a crucial uh, component, but I don't want to reduce everything uh, to identity. So I was teaching this course uh, at Yale um, uh, on faith and globalization, and I had a mantra for my students, uh, which said something like this, all monocausal explanations are suspect. <laughs> All non-causal explanations of conflicts between people uh, as individuals, let alone uh, as nations, uh, are suspect. In that sense, also identity as a single explanation is suspect, but ident identity as a component of the struggle is certainly very, very important. And, uh, um, and in the, those struggles for, for identity, for who am I, for being able to feel at home in a place. I mean, when we think of today's identity struggles in the, in the West, especially around uh, immigration, issues of immigration, the question of who are we, how does it, what does it mean to feel at home, to be in a place that belongs to us, that is, in a sense, us, those issues become uh, really crucial. Um, and they, they are the a significant reason for struggles. Right, right. And so how, how have, you, have you seen this kind of play out? Um, I'd, I'd love to, at some stage in our conversation, get on to um, some of the culture wars um, that we are experiencing today, but I, I don't want to conflate those with um, hot wars, with, with actual military struggle, because um, there are very significant differences between those two things. Yes. So can, can you unpack for us um, some of the sort of the case studies that where you have seen this, this instance of, of conflict uh, arising well most uh, um, i'm most familiar with the former, former yugoslavia but we can also take current discussions um, um emergence of the new european right uh and the claiming of uh, europe as a christian continent and in the name of claiming europe as a christian continent uh, trying to keep at, uh, at bay uh, everybody who doesn't quite identify in those terms, whose color of skin is different, whose religion is different, so that then the Muslims uh, and brown on darker skinned people end up being non-European, and one then thinks in terms of um, there is a there is a counter colonization going on, and we need to push back against that colonization. That kind of rhetoric is really. Um, powerful and, and uh, completely misguided in my judgment, but it's very powerful in uh, European settings and it plays itself out also in American politics as we speak uh, right now. So those are um, examples. Uh, I can give you my own home country 30 years ago. I can give you Europe of today. I can give you United States uh, of, of today. Uh, it, it's interesting when the conflicts around identity in, in Yugoslavia were carried uh, out, and they were carried in the name of partly religion, in the name of language, in the, lay, in the name of a certain form of cultural belonging, uh, Europe at that time was united. This was immediately after the fall of Berlin Wall, and everybody was in this big uh, separation fest of uh, uniting. And what was happening, Yugoslavia was falling apart. And so Croatians appeared as these barbarians who will not unite, <laughs> uh, but who want to break apart, or Serbians uh, 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 as well in this, in this regard. Uh, and yet today we see that similar processes are happening in the rest of the world. And they're happening because uh, globalization threatens uh, a sense of who, who I am. Uh, for me as a Croatian, it was, um, well, um, is, is, it, is it good that there are Croatians? <laughs> a very simple question. And response is, uh, I, I hope, yes, it's very good that there are many other people. Is it good that there's Croatian language and so forth? Once you start asking questions in this, uh, in this way, then kind of concrete identities, you see how important they are for uh, our very sense of who we are as uh, human beings and why they need to be preserved. And so the central issue for me was always, how does one 
properly maintain boundaries without those boundaries becoming unporous, without those boundaries being erected so high that it becomes a fortress. How do we have these kind of breathing boundaries where we can be both enriched by another person as well as retain our own identity? And that's a negotiation that needs to take place. Right, right. There's a wonderful book that I keep returning to by Colin Gunton, a theologian who's passed on now, but the one, the three and the many, where he talks about the tug of war that happens between unity and diversity, but between the particular and the universal. Yeah. And I guess in the realm of political philosophy, yeah, how, how do I be concretely and distinctly my tribe, which is important, but how, how am I also going to be one with the, the greater nation, the nation state, et, et cetera? Is, is there a distinctively kind of Christian solution or, or suggestion to a solution to that? Well, uh, I, I think so. I, I, and um, I mean, my argument uh, was that um, uh, probably a very good place to look, at least for me, uh, it was, uh, and I developed the whole theology uh, out of this, uh, is the concept of Catholic personality. And that was developed in the in, um, um, uh, uh, ecumenical discussions. You have it in uh, Orthodox uh, theology. You have it also in, in Catholic theology. And Catholic personality is a person who is within the church, but is uh, refracts in their own personhood the entirety of the church. So the richer, the more of the entirety of the church a person who is in the church refracts in their own particular way, the richer personality that person becomes. But that means that it's not that you have members and 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 and. Uh, and the body. And so from members have peacefully to fit into the place where they are in the body. The picture is more complex. The picture is such that body is always as a whole, you and you are in the body. And so in that sense, uh, the idea is that individual interests and communal interests can come close to being identical so that we, we don't uh, have these discrete entities that then bump at each other every time they want to move somewhere, so that the whole is already in me. And I think that's, uh, that's a very important, uh, I think also in political um, realm, and also in Christian imagination, I think about, uh, about politics. Uh, I believe that there cannot be salvation for or, or full being oneself for one person without everybody else being saved in the same uh, uh, at, at the same time, so that you have this uh, that it's it's not simply about individuals achieving something, but individuals achieve what they need to achieve only when the whole is achieved. In the kingdom of God, will I be fully myself? Right? Not just that the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, will be fully realized. But I, as an individual, can only be who I truly am in the larger context. It, uh, and, and this reminds me very strongly of Trinitarian theology, which is, which is where um, Colin Gunton's book goes as well, that, you know, okay. the one, the three and the many, that, that actually the church has never confessed that the three persons are three individuals as though they are like billiard balls that clack into each other, which is the, you know, the, the great image that you, you sometimes use. You know, the, the individual um, is sort of self-contained, whereas the person um, is constituted in, in relations of love with the other. And as Christ says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And, and actually his personhood is not individuated. His, his personhood is, is in a state of relationship and reliance and dependence and love. Um, is, yeah, can that be can that be a model even in politics, or is that or is that is that drawing too long a bow? Well, uh, I, I I think something analogous can be the, the case. I think my, my sense is that the best way to to think about it is not in terms of identities. So uh, so that what happen it happens in Trinitarian life first in inner Trinitarian life uh, in the imminent Trinity, then what happens in the economic trinity, then what happens in the church, then what happens in the individual. These are all 
analogs to one another, but they're not, uh, not identical. And I think right. there can be also analogs then for our relationship in the kind of more se so-called so secular realm, uh, relationship between nations, the relationship between religions, relationships between ethnic, uh, ethnic groups, so that the, we don't construe identity as a kind of self-enclosed and then subsequently in relationship with others, but that identities are always construed as already being in relationship to, uh, to another, which means that the other is always already in me <laughs> and part of me. Mm. So I used to say always during the conflict in former Yugoslavia, I mean, you may not like it, but to be Croatian is to have Serbs as neighbors. You cannot be Croatians without, Croatian without having had or without having Serbs as neighbors. They're not just a kind of obstacle. They're part and parcel of your identity. And once we start thinking in those terms, I think we can then expand our sphere of concern rather than make a move that has been so many times made and, and is consistently predictably uh, made, namely that in the cases of conflict, I want to drive the other out of my self-perception of who I am, right? So that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the drive toward purity. I, my own self, I have to have this pure identity. In order to have pure identity, I have to eject uh, uh, all others from somehow my conception of myself. Um, right. That ends up with pursuit of the pure purity of language, ends up with the pursuit of uh, purity of uh, social spaces, purity of cultural uh, surroundings that, uh, that we have. And it is an extremely violent form of constitution of identity, paradigmatic for me for the movement of exclusion. Wow, wow. And, and would you go so far as to um, preach that message into the current culture in the US, for instance, to say that, you know, in order to be on the left, <laughs> um, that is to include your neighbor who is on the right. And in order to be on the right, that is to include your neighbor who is on the left. Is that, is that, is that part of the application of this? I, I, think it's a, I think it is part of the application. I think in my imagination, I have to imagine myself as part of a community with the one who is my quote unquote enemy. I agree with you, we shouldn't uh, think in terms of war, identify culture wars with uh, other kinds of uh, de facto war, wars, armed conflict. physical mm -hmm. weapons, mm -hmm. uh, armed conflict. Um, and I think it's a sometimes mistake to, to go that way. And we have almost weaponized ourselves and made conflicts more uh, intractable because we use war, war terminology to describe them. So I think we should we should shy away from those. But but I think uh, the, the situation um, applies um, and applies. Uh, uh, I've uh, just I'm just about to tweet uh, about tweet something. I was thinking about it quite quite some time. Um, you know, uh, my my father was uh, never wanted to speak ill of anybody who wasn't hearing what's being said about the person. And you imagine when I was a teenager, those were boring conversations around the table. You can't gossip. What, what, kind, of, uh, <laughs> what kind of conversations around the table are those, right? We're not we and we gossip about somebody, somebody else. We draw a lot of humor, a lot of energy just from, uh, from these, this, this kind of attitude. I think there's a right intuition on my father's part. I have to learn how to speak well, even of my enemy, which is to simply say, uh, I need to attune myself to see the good that is there, notwithstanding all the negative things that are there. We shouldn't let the presence of negative occlude the presence of the good. And for Christian standpoint, uh, goodness is primordial. There is more goodness in, any, in my enemy than there is evil, right? So nobody becomes fully identified with, with evil. That's a fundamental conviction of, of the Christian faith. And I think we need to then embody this in interchanges with one another. And that would also mean I recognize something that I affirm as good in you, even though you are in relationship of enmity to me. 
right? And in this series, we're, we're going back to uh, our kind of origin story in the scriptures into, into Genesis. And uh, we'll, we'll have a look at one very famous story of conflict, Cain and Abel, in a second. But, but all of what you're saying also reminds me of, of Genesis chapter 3, as you talk about you know, none of us are in the situation of purity, um, and none of us are wholly good and none of us are wholly evil. Um, it, it reminds me of the story of Adam and it reminds me of a much maligned doctrine called the doctrine of original sin. Um, because with all that you've been saying um, in this interview here, I'm actually thinking maybe original sin is not a bad doctrine to hold to. Um, may, maybe there's, there's truth to it that can be applied to this situation of conflict. Do you think? Well, yeah, uh, I, yes, uh, I, I do, um, and I, I think that um, just just like affirmation of primordial goodness will predispose me to see the good even where I normally wouldn't be inclined to identify and find good, so also uh, a sense of um, original sin would make me immediately attuned to uh, warping that happens in my own soul. We all participate in um, the evil that is larger than ourselves, that by which we are in a sense inhabited and which we can never um, extirpate, which we can never clean, clean ourselves from so that in the classical Protestant uh, <clears throat> Lutheran formulation or Luther's formulation, I am simul justus et peccator. I'm always both justified mm. and a sinner. I'm always good and also inhabited by, uh, by evil. Now, once one keeps that uh, in mind, uh, I, I think we have a very different um, and less arrogant uh, less purity-driven uh, attitude toward both ourselves and toward others. Mm. You've got a great line in Exclusion and Embrace, and I'm going to, going to forget it, but um, you, you talk about the, the problem of I, I exclude the other person from the circle of humanity and I exclude myself from the circle of, of, of those who are evil. Is it, is it something like what, what, yes. what, what do you say? Uh, yeah. you, you'll be able to remember. Right, so so that will be that will be a a, a different and, and and maybe more a more um, rhetorically compelling way to put what I was trying to say <laughs> earlier, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure that I can uh, that that I, I remember exactly uh, 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 my own quote, but but it is a, a sense of that I uh, I dehumanize the other person uh, on account of the evil they uh, have perpetrated, but I exclude uh, and excuse myself from any possible evil that might be uh, that might be in me and so i place myself in the light, light of pure innocence whereas uh, i dehumanize the other and of course then i have already created irresolvable conflict by having this dualistic worldview or dual, uh, applying a dualistic worldview to myself and to the other person, and conveniently, of course, placing myself uh, in in the realm of innocence and uh, banishing the other person in the realm of uh, of sinfulness. Yes, it's it's Solzhenitsyn's line, isn't it? That you know the line dividing you know, humanity is 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 not between the, the evil people over there and the good people here. It's uh, it runs through the middle of every human yes. heart. And exactly. and how fascinating to have that in in Genesis. You know, we begin with the image of God, and as you say, the primordial goodness, mm -hmm. and then we have a fall from that goodness in into into this state, and we 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 are um, very multifaceted, uh, warped uh, creatures um, as well. And then, as you move on in, in Genesis, we, we get to Genesis chapter 4 and kind of the, the outworking of a fall from that primordial goodness. And it's fascinating the way it works itself out in the Cain and Abel story. Um, there, there you've got, you know, the, the firstborn Cain, uh, who I'm sure there were high hopes for. Here, here, is, here is the firstborn of Adam and Eve. And um, 
and you know he brings the the the, the first fruits of his uh, crops to the Lord in this in this sense of sacrifice. Abel is a keeper of, of flocks, so a shepherd. He he brings blood sacrifice, and the Lord looks with favor on Abel's sacrifice. He does not look with favor on Cain's sacrifice. And uh, Cain's face falls. Uh, wh wh what do you take from this in, in terms of like the, the psychology of what's going on? What, why is Cain's face falling? And, and what can we learn about conflict from this? Well, it, uh, what it stri strikes me is that um, even with the name, uh, uh, e even with the names of the two, um, it always mm. vapor it means vapor, kind of nothingness, lightness. <laughs> Uh, Cain is a proud mother. Uh, I have uh, given birth to a, to a man uh, with the help of uh, help of God. Um, Cain uh, is 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 almost like a rich farmer, and uh, Abel is is a, a, a kind of a poor poor shepherd. Um, and you have certain kind of expectations of ordering, hierarchical ordering between between the two. They were already set in life in such a way that. Um, oh, do you hear this? Uh, a little bit, but it's fine. Yeah, they've they've already been set in life in, in, in such a way that there is a that, that there is an ordering, and once you start uh, shifting anything in that ordering. Um, Cain, is, Cain is going to feel threatened, and that's what I think happens in that story. Once Abel, mm. maybe out of insecurity of being uh, second born uh, and having a, a less uh, prominent um, occupation, um, uh, brings a sacrifice that is much more, uh, th that demands much more of him than what Abel did, just some fruit of his, uh, his field. God responds to Abel's sacrifice differently than God does to Cain's sacrifice, and suddenly Cain has been threatened in its identity, self-perception, that he's nurtured all of his life. He knew how the world was set, and now there's a judgment on the part of God uh, that Abel was better than, than Cain, and suddenly the world is turned upside down, and... Um, what Cain was invested in as his own identity is no longer the case. And uh, right. I, I think takedown of Abel then is almost pre-programmed into that story. Somehow Cain has to be reduced to a measure if uh, Abel has to be reduced to his measure, uh, or Cain has to readjust his identity. And so if you have right. this encrusted identity, uh, unwilling to change, unable to change, uh, then uh, it will end up in a conflict. And often conflicts are with a high sense of who I am that somehow has been threatened by somebody else. Make America Great Again, right? <laughs> is uh, <laughs> kind of a game is uh, we were great. Uh, now somehow we're falling in stature. And so the the idea is, uh, let's keep that greatness and anything that threatens it uh, ends up being problematic. We are not readjusting our identity uh, or we are not um, a kind of expressing greatness in forms of agency, but in forms of putting down that which uh, wants to elevate somebody else uh, as, opposed to, as opposed to us. So um, yeah. it's applicable in many domains, uh, that story, which I think is very powerful. Yeah, and it sets off this trajectory that, that continues throughout the scriptures. It's, it's, it's almost never the firstborn <laughs> who right. is the favored one. It's almost never the strong one who is the one favored by the Lord. It's, it's always the underdog. It's always the weak. It's always the marginalized. It's, yeah. it's never the one who makes a name for themselves. That's a Tower of Babel kind of a thing. It's always the Lord coming down and, and meeting the weak where they are. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so as you say, you know, the, go on. No, I was going to say, it's, it's also, it, it's interesting uh, that, um, that uh, evil that, that is kind of embodied in Cain's actions is not just within him. It's also outside. <laughs> Um, uh, and God warns him <laughs> of this evil that is like a beast uh, seeking to capture. 
him. And I, I think that that's a very, very interesting uh, observation about how, um, uh, I mean, if you translate it in, into interpersonal relationships, it's not just how we think of ourselves, but it's also how others think of us, how we are thought of. I have to preserve my stature in the view of others and my projection then onto others, what they might think about me can be additional source of my own insecurity and therefore lead me into um, inappropriate uh, violent, uh, violent action so that evil is almost in the whole of surroundings in which I find myself, both in me and outside. And I think that corresponds to um, the way in which often, uh, say, Apostle Paul speaks of sin. Uh, sin is a power. It, it, it isn't just my own willing agency, which it is, but it's not just that. So, and I've seen that in former Yugoslavia uh, also. It's uh, once you start moving in that direction, making individual decisions, trying to preserve your, your identity, your statue, uh, suddenly this becomes a whole power that comes at you from the outside, you participate in it, and, and there's a, di a dialogue, uh, almost like a dance between the individual evil in the heart and evil outside. Wow, wow. See, that, that is a richly psychological um, interpretation of what's going on, but it's, it's also acknowledging that there's more than the psyche going on. There's, there's more than just you. Um, yeah. yeah you, I think you, so therefore, important. you believe in evil with a capital E. Um, spiritual powers, you know. What, what, what would you say to people who, who say, oh, come on, Miroslav, this is, this is medieval thinking, you know, to, to think about evil with a capital E, to think about spiritual evil out there where we're modern people we surely can't believe in that what would you say well i i think i did i'd invite them to uh, to kind of observe um why uh, or, or reflect on why is it relatively peaceful um uh citizens uh say former yugoslavia lived close to each in proximity to each other had little gripes and so forth but nothing that they couldn't uh, resolve and live around why, when uh, propaganda starts uh, uh, blaring uh, at them, when uh, certain images uh, uh, start being portraying uh, uh, in, in media, why do they suddenly, why the beast in them suddenly is awakened by the beast that is, uh, that is outside, um, and why this dance then uh, begins? Um, uh, why do we speak of systemic racism? It's not just in individual attitudes. Individuals' attitudes participate in something that's larger, that is, that is shaping those attitudes, and these attitudes reinforce. So we can, in many domains, see how there is a kind of system at work. Whether one then wants to think of it as a, as a kind of spiritual capital E um, or satanic force, uh, uh, or however one wants to describe it in religious uh, terms, it's hard to deny that it's, that it's there. Uh, it's there in economy, it's there in politics, it's there in, in cultural uh, self-identification. Uh, so it seems to me that it just witnesses, bears witness to the fact that we are both individuals, but we are part of larger units and groups, and we cannot imagine our life being uh, a, um, simply that of individual um, units, self-enclosed monads. Right, right. And at that stage, that becomes the more rounded, sophisticated um, vision of evil. Where, whereas if you just psychologize everything, if you, if you just keep everything within the, um, within the sphere of the individual, it is a less sophisticated um, view, view of evil and, and less able to account for the, the historical facts of, of how, how conflicts actually arise. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I, I very much agree. I mean, it, it would seem to me, it would seem to me also, I mean, it's hard to, uh, so the earlier story uh, about, about the snake um, and, and the tree, mm. <laughs> is it outside or is it inside, right? But, but I mean, mm. think of it, if you think of it this way, um, the, the, there is a, the, the entire world 
or garden was given to Adam and Eve. Every tree and everything else, there's one tree that wasn't. <laughs> that one tree um, made it so that Adam and Eve thought, I don't have enough. Mm. Cancel the gratitude for uh, 99.9.9% uh, of what was there. Right. Uh, yeah. Absence of gratitude and mm. construction of oneself as not having enough that was then reinforced by the snake from the outside, evil from the outside, that ended up as, as, a, as, as an occasion for the fall. And Apostle Paul speaks about uh, ingratitude as at the heart of the original sin. Right? Um, that's in Romans 1. They did not give thanks or praise to God. And I think gratitude and praise are intimately uh, related. Um, so, so you can you can see it in various um, various uh, places, and and then if you apply it to the mo to modern economy, uh, I, I am never enough of a person because um, the entire way of life is reinforcing, uh, portraying itself as that one tree in the middle of the garden, right? So, so right, right. The, the the there is a whole industry creating those trees that I cannot quite reach that I don't have yet and create right, right. Then an attitude of negativity toward myself will uh, yes. throw us in, into depression. Um, yes. Everything ends up being inadequate because there's something that slightly I perceive is slightly better. Yes. But consider the nature of the deception. It is to say um, when you eat of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will see. So the, the promise is fulfillment. And there's a, such an interesting fulfillment. They eat the fruits and then their eyes are opened and they see that they are naked. So what, what do they now see? They see their lack. And actually, if they thought they were lacking before, how much more lacking do they feel they are now? Because they're, they're seeking to fill themselves, not, not by the generous God, but by their own designs. And as we know, this is exactly the design of, of the, uh, in, in the current system. That's, that's the design of the system. The, the, the result yeah. nakedness is not a byproduct, but it is, is part of the design, <laughs> right? So, so yes. I have to, the, the way in which I satisfy need can continue to satisfy need if there is lack that comes afterwards. Why do we design products that, that are relatively short in quality sometimes so that people can buy more of it? Uh, we find ways in which we can uh, make sure that lack is always there so that not just the planned product, obsolescence, the lack is systematically yeah. produced. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's built into the system to make us lack and then to make us desire yeah. more. And when we get the thing that does not fulfill us, we feel the lack all the more and on yeah. it goes. And, and I guess uh, one biblical phrase for that would be idolatry. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's woven into the system, isn't it? Um, and do you, do you draw on the work of René Girard at all? Are, are you kind of um, interested in, in that, that kind of idea of mimetic desire that... Um, yeah. Be it's because the other person desires the thing. I, I didn't. I didn't really desire that thing until the other person did, um, yeah. and then as soon as they desire, suddenly we're competitors in this in this thing. Is it? Yeah, that that has yeah, quite I'm, explanatory I'm, I, power, I think. Uh, yes, I, I think that's quite a bit of power in the, uh, in the idea of mimetic uh, desire. I'm not necessarily keen on some other aspects of Girard's work, but the idea of mimetic desire, I think, is. Is, is quite right. And it has to do also with this idea of what used to be described as a, 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 a desire for distinction and is now described as competitiveness. And competitiveness is systematically um, inculcated as a feature of modern, modern life. Modernity is unthinkable without a competitive relationship. Um, Hartmut Rosa, a sociologist from Germany, speaks out um, 
a, a feature of modernity being dynamic st stabilization so that I can just like riding a bike. I can always only stay up if I am pedaling. And it's not just if I'm pedaling, but it, if I'm doing a bit more than I did uh, before. So that speeding up uh, and extending the range is fundamental to uh, the way in which modern societies work. At the heart of that is competition and competitive relationship to others. So that I have to be, to be who I am, I have to be better than somebody else and be always better. And this being better is of course not, there, there's no stable measure at which we can, uh, with which we can measure ourselves. It's constantly moving, which then ends up being this relatively empty idea of competitiveness, which I think is one of the, 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 the most unchristian ideas that I've encountered. And people are really mm. resistant to that idea because they realize that the whole system falls <laughs> if you give up on, <laughs> on competitiveness. Yeah. And, and then when you bring it into the Genesis 4 world, um, when you see the greater distinction of another, Cain seeing Abel get the favor of the Lord, um, then his rival must be eliminated um, yeah. and violently so. And I think what's, what's fascinating to me about Cain is where anger and self-righteousness kind of um, unite um, that, that it is he, he thought that his own contribution should have been enough should have been by itself um, you know uh, regarded as um, as sufficient um, and it's the self-righteousness that turns to anger which, which I think is such a common theme within within the scriptures think of Jonah or think of Saul um, some of the angriest people uh, are those who think of themselves as, as being right you know the, the world is not um, in flames because of people thinking people being wrong it's it, it so much seems to be the world is in flames because of people who think that they are right with a capital r right right uh, that, that's a, that, that, yeah that, that's a very very good observation and they that they don't they never what they deserve they always deserve more than what they get and they see themselves as a blessing to the world um, whereas uh, most of us don't, right? And if they if they're not perceived that way, that the, there's constant uh, um, uh, bearing of of, of grudge, um, and therefore need to self-inflate, uh, to portray oneself uh, as better, and therefore need to uh, tell all sorts of lies about the world and about themselves. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it just. Uh, it, it, uh, it's amazing how much bruised ego, how much damage a bruised ego uh, will inflict. And the more power the ego has, the more damage it inflicts. Right, right. Which brings us back sort of full circle to where we began with um, exclusion and embrace um, the prodigal son. Um, there again, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence that here again, we've got two brothers in the story that Jesus tells. Um, and again, it, it winds up that it's the younger brother who actually ends up um, uh, at, certainly at the end of the story in, in the embrace of the father. Um, and who is it who is murderous with rage um, at the end? It's, it's the, the self-righteous elder brother. Um, what is it? What is it you think that perhaps you know the story of Jesus or the, the story of the prodigal son or, or the, the gospel in general can teach us in, in a world where we are racked by self righteousness and the desire for vainglory? Um, how, how is Jesus uh, a solution to this? So, so if one looks at um, older brother. Um, he, he's got he's got the life defined for himself and how things should go. If you follow the rules, um, you should be uh, rewarded, and if you fail to follow the rules, uh, you should be um, punished or you should lose. Um, and we tend to organize our lives around controllable, predictable set of actions 
that would ensure security, safety, success, uh, us being on the uh, on the top. And in principle, there's nothing wrong with uh, some of these some of these rules, but it seems to me that um, a life is such that um, strict following of rules always um, ends up breaking people and always ends up benefiting people who for no particular desert of their own are more constitutionally aligned and are able to perform. If one is more gifted, if one is person is more uh, less of an instable of a character for whatever whatever reason, hormonal uh, balance, uh, imbalances and balances are, are distributed uh, differently, uh, uh, then, uh, then suddenly the person uh, who is at a disadvantage remains and is always uh, pushed down to a greater uh, disadvantage. And if we think that that's a, that's a great world, right? If you are somebody like Nietzsche, who thinks that um, uh, heroic performance uh, is uh, what it is all, all about, an exertion of power in that sense, whether through following rules or through other, uh, through other means, then this is a world which you, would, uh, which you would like. But if you think that the world is such that uh, all human beings, created in the image of God, uh, deserve to be loved in an equal measure as God loves each human being in equal uh, measure, um, then you will see that what Jesus brings is uh, precisely possibility of having a world where people, notwithstanding their multiple inequalities, can form a single communion of love and value each other for their humanity and not for a serendipitously acquired uh, ability to perform in ways that would uh, glorify your uh, your ego. Um, so um, my sense is that uh, Jesus, what Jesus brings is grace, is mm ability to embrace the person, the one who is sick. And this is how the, the story is, is, uh, uh, is told uh, of the prodigal son. Who did Jesus come to attend to? For whose well-being he's come? For those who are lost, for those who are uh, sick and therefore need the doctor, who need to be found. Um, such a world is the world which, with, with which I identify. Uh, and such a world is the world which uh, Christ came to create. Right, right. And I think the the modern world so often is is like it's like the parable of the prodigal son with the older and younger brothers, but without a father. Um, yeah, and if yeah, you could yeah. imagine such a story, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've that's, just imagined modern very, politics, haven't you? Yeah. That, that's yeah. a very very good way to put it. In some ways, we uh, we, we had a kind of a father, right? So so um, as long as we have the idea that um, that 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 we have to attend to every human being, no matter what state they find themselves, that it's our responsibility to care for them, that they have equal rights, and that they. They, that, that to them belong equal care, as does uh, to those who are who are powerful and more deserving. To that extent, it, it the, the the law of love that the father embodies is part and parcel of our uh, of our cultural uh, heritage. But once that gets lost, um, it, it's a scary world, and I think right, I'm afraid right. that we are at the point of losing uh, this. So that um, yeah, Nietzsche, Nietzsche, might, Nietzsche might be might, might be celebrating a a, a victory. <laughs> I, I I hope I'm wrong. Right. Uh, it's very hard to judge those uh, those, those trends, but it seems to me that there's strong, powerful forces where where performance orientation trumps uh, um, uh, kind of our, our common uh, humanity, and even where tribal belonging trumps our whole common humanity. And once we are in that situation, at least we are, I think, uh, to state it a bit less 
prophetically and more analytically, the more in danger I think we are to um, have the prodigal sons um, end up uh, eating the stuff together with wine and uh, all their brothers uh, feasting uh, in the fruits of their um, partly earned, partly stolen labors. Right, right. But let's, let's pray that we all receive the invitation from uh, the gracious one who invites us to sit down as elder brother types, older brother types, left and right from all tribes uh, around the same banqueting table. That's the, that's the great vision, isn't it? Um, Miroslav, you, you've been incredibly uh, generous with your time. Thank you so much. Uh, if, if people want to catch up more with uh, your work, what, what is the best uh, next step for them? Well, I, I think, uh, I think my, my own work now on um, Exclusion and Embrace, a new book that came out. I have a new edition of uh, End of Memories coming out, which deals with some of the similar uh, topics. Uh, the coming uh, the coming work is actually on on the home of God world as the home of God, which uh, story of prodigal actually uh, functions as a, as a very important uh, paradigm for that uh, that well, and um, obviously they they can they can follow me on Twitter or, or on Facebook and we have a podcast uh, for the life of the world that um, that I'm often on but other people's as well it's curated. Um, podcast so um, if anybody's interested come and join us I, I think what really profoundly uh, drives uh, quite a bit of my work right now is um, is that we have lost in the contemporary Western and uh, to the extent that Western culture has spread um, throughout the globe more generally we have lost a sense and deeper reflection of what it means to lead a life that is worthy of our humanity. Uh, we, most of our energies uh, are spent around ver acquiring various forms of capital so that we can competitive, have competitive advantage. That can be educational capital, that can be um, a kind of physical, aesthetic uh, capital, that can be uh, monetary capital of various sorts of sorts of capital, and we think when we have that, we have uh, we we live uh, uh, we we will be able to live a good life. And a friend of mine has mm -hmm. then used the picture of a painter. We're like a painter who's obsessing about tools of the trade, but never gets really to paint. Never gets really to live life because the entire life is about the means for living rather than about the ends of life. We have forgotten how to think, right. so, think about what are the ends of our lives? Wow. What is the shape mm. of true humanity? And that's what I want to retrieve for the broader culture and also for the church. Mm. Mm, wonderful, wonderful. And I guess we need that vision, don't we, of that primordial goodness that you spoke of as, as well, the, the, the generosity of God, the grace uh, that, that means we can simply receive that and, and enjoy it rather than grasp at the, at the, 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 the idols. But um, Marislav Wolf, thank you so much for joining us on Reset. My, my pleasure.